Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to the class. Uh, in this video, uh, we will discuss uh, chapter 22, uh, the respiratory system. And it's almost fitting that we cover uh, this body system uh, at this point in time because it's due to a respiratory infection is the whole reason why we have to move uh, to online classes. All right, the first thing uh, we'll talk about is what respiration actually means. And respiration is the process of exchanging gases between uh, the atmosphere and then uh, the cells within the body. And it includes uh, multiple steps. So you should be familiar with matching each term to what uh, the definition is. Uh, the first one is ventilation. Now this is the generic moving uh, air in and out of the lungs. So nothing is being exchanged. It's just air moving in or air moving out of the lungs. The next step after that is what's called external respiration. This is the exchange of gases between uh, the air that's found in the lungs and the blood. See, after that point, you have uh, the, the transport of those gases uh, by the blood between the lungs and uh, the cells. And that will lead you to internal respiration. This is the exchange of gases between the blood and the cells. So don't confuse internal versus external respiration. Then the last step in this process is called cellular respiration. And cellular respiration is a, a series of uh, chemical reactions that end up uh, using oxygen uh, to produce uh, ATP and also will produce the byproduct of carbon dioxide. So this is something that uh, you should have covered uh, in, a, or in a biology class. Now this includes things like uh, glycolysis, uh, the Krebs cycle, the electron transport chain. So those steps we won't get into uh, for this class, but just know that that is a part of respiration. Taking the oxygen that you just uh, breathed in to eventually go through a series of reactions to end up producing ATP or producing energy. All right, when we talk about the respiratory system, there are uh, two various tracts that those organs can be divided into, the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. So you should be familiar with what uh, tract each organ uh, belongs to. For the upper respiratory tract, that includes the nose, the nasal cavity, uh, the sinuses, uh, the pharynx, and technically only part of the larynx, but for this class we will consider the larynx a part of the upper respiratory tract because some parts fall under the upper part and some parts fall under the uh, lower tract. But in general, it's considered to be a part of the upper res respiratory tract. And then the organs that are found in the lower uh, respiratory tract are the trachea, the lungs, and then the bronchial tree. And we'll talk about all of these uh, throughout this chapter. All right, here is a uh, generic illustration of the respiratory system. You have the nose here and the mouth here, uh, going down to the throat, and the trachea, and then the lungs. And we'll talk about all these features in a lot more detail here in the next few minutes. All right, we'll start with the uh, more external structures, then we'll work our way toward the lungs and more internally uh, within the lungs. So the first uh, structure we'll talk about is the nose and the nasal cavity. Uh, the nose is going to be filled with a large number of hairs and it's there to prevent anything that's uh, larger from entering uh, the respiratory system. The space just behind the nose is the nasal cavity and this is divided by a structure called the uh, nasal septum. Anytime you see the word septum, that's a uh, dividing structure. And this cavity, the nasal cavity, is going to be lined with a layer of uh, mucus produced by the mucous membranes. And that's there to not only uh, filter the air, because it will help catch things that shouldn't be entering the respiratory system, but it's also there to warm the air and also to moisten the air. All right, moving on with the, with the upper part of the tract, we have uh, the sinuses. These are air-filled spaces that are found within various bones of the skull. And hopefully you'll recognize these names from uh, when we talked about the skeletal system uh, last semester. And they have the maxillary, uh, frontal, ethmoid, and sphenoid sinuses. And the mucous membrane that is found lining the nasal cavity is continuous with the sinuses. Uh, the sinuses are there to help lessen the weight of the skull. If these spaces, these air-filled spaces, were more solid, your skull would be a lot heavier than it already is. And the sinuses also act as a voice resonant chamber. So this explains why whenever you are congested, either due to a cold or a flu or allergies, 
This is why your voice sounds differently. It's because the sound cannot resonate properly as it normally would throughout the skull. That's why it sounds more muffled. That's why the, uh, the tone sounds different. All right, this image is one that we'll come back to uh, a few times in this chapter. I'll point out I know, the frontal sinus here, right in between the eyes. Uh, sphenoid uh, sinus here, uh, nose, mouth here. And we'll come back to uh, this image here in a moment. All right, next structure we'll talk about is the pharynx. Uh, the pharynx is uh, just uh, posterior to the oral cavity and between the uh, nasal cavity and the larynx. And a good generic way to think of this is when you hear the term pharynx, think of your throat. Because this is the area that includes the uh, esophagus and trachea. So the pharynx is a passageway for both food and air. So food will go down your esophagus onto the stomach. And that's something we'll talk about in our next video for the next chapter. And it also will conduct air through the trachea into the lungs. And because the pharynx uh, covers such a variety of, of areas, it's going to be identified by region. And there are three uh, regions in the pharynx. You have the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. And the prefixes tell you what those uh, structures are near. Nasopharynx, that's just behind uh, the nasal cavity. Oropharynx, oro is reference to uh, mouth. So it's going to be just behind the mouth. And laryngopharynx, uh, right near the larynx, right near the voice box. So going back to this image here, uh, nasopharynx, right here, just behind the nasal cavity. And you see the opening to the nose there. Oropharynx, just behind the mouth, right there. There's the tongue uh, at a slight angle. And then the laryngopharynx, right about here, right by the voice box. So definitely uh, be able to match where these sections are uh, by a picture or by a definition. All right, the larynx. This is an uh, enlargement in the airway that is uh, superior to the trachea and just inferior to the pharynx. And it's made up of a very large network, very complex network of muscles and different types of uh, cartilages. But of all of those different types of cartilages, we we'll only will talk about two uh, specifically by name. Uh, the first one is the thyroid cartilage. This is what will form the Adam's apple. That's much more prominent in males. It will you know, protrude out of the front of the throat. All right, in this image, we have both the anterior and posterior view of this. So here is the thyroid cartilage here, and that part right there where the cursor is on, that's the part that would stick out and you could feel very easily and see very noticeably on a male. And then if you were to flip this around and look behind it, this is what you would see. This image here for letter B is just this one just turned around and looking from uh, the posterior view. The other cartilage that we'll talk about when it comes to the larynx is the epiglottic cartilage. This is the only one of all of the cartilages that's connected to the larynx that has elastic tissue, not hyaline tissue. The specific cartilage will form what's called the epiglottis. And this is the structure that, whenever you uh, swallow, covers up the entryway to the trachea. So food or liquid doesn't go down into your lungs. So whenever someone eats too quickly or the food portions are too large, and they start to choke on their food, uh, people may say, well, the food went down the wrong way. Well, that is actually what is happening. It's not going down the esophagus. It's going the other way down to the trachea. All right, so coming back to this image that we've already seen, this flap right here where the cursor is, that's the epiglottis. So whenever you swallow, your tongue right here will force this to close and make a seal so nothing gets down past it into the trachea. Anything that gets past it and goes in here will make you start to uh, cough and gag because that's preventing you from breathing well. Now within the larynx you have uh, two horizontal folds that are made up of various connective tissues and muscles. The, these are the upper folds and the lower folds. The upper ones are called the false vocal cords and they're called that because they do not produce any sound. The lower folds are called the true vocal cords. These are the ones that do produce sound. And these are the ones that will vibrate and stretch and according to the, uh, the pitch of the sound that's being made. All right, for here, uh, the first two images, 
clearly are illustrations. The one down here at the bottom is a real image of how one would look. So this is when the vocal cords are closed. This is when the vocal cords are open. And for here, the structures that are, are white in color, those are the true vocal cords. These are what will stretch and vibrate and produce sound. The false vocal cords are the tissue around it, right here and on this side, and those don't produce any sound. And this image here, this illustration, is exactly what you're seeing in uh, part C, or letter C. But of course, C is real and B is not. And then this is what you would see whenever you are intubating someone. You're putting a, a tube down the trachea into their lungs uh, so that patient can breathe. So this is what you are looking into. All right, that leads us to the next part of our system, as, of course, the trachea, also known as the windpipe. It's about 12 centimeters long. And it's going to be anterior to the esophagus. So this is the tube that you can easily feel in the front part of your throat. So you can feel the trachea and the esophagus will be behind it as a collapsible tube. And the reason why you can feel it and see it very clearly is because the wall of the trachea is held open by C-shaped rings of cartilage, and hyaline cartilage to be specific. And the length of the trachea is lined with ciliated mucous membranes, and that's there to help capture uh, and trap particles that shouldn't be going down to the lungs. All right, so going back to this image, you see the trachea listed here and then here. And you can clearly see these individual rings. Those individual uh, hyaline cartilage rings that have a, a C uh, shape to them. All right, here on this image, uh, you see the part of the larynx, the voice box, with the thyroid cartilage here, which would form the Adam's apple uh, for, for males. Uh, the trachea, again, the individual rings of hyaline cartilage. And we'll talk about these other structures here in a moment. Now the next structure we'll talk about is called the bronchial tree. And this is a structure that consists of uh, several branched airways that are coming off of the trachea and getting progressively smaller until you get to the individual air sacs uh, within the lungs. Now the initial branching of the trachea is what's called the uh, primary bronchi. And bronchi is this plural uh, for bronchus. So you have a right bronchus and the left bronchus. So they are just generically referred to as bronchi. And this initial you know, dividing off the trachea is called primary. Then after this initial division from the trachea, uh, the bronchi will get uh, smaller and smaller and smaller as you get more internal into the lungs. Now the bronchial tree has uh, some main uh, branches, you could call it. And there are multiple names that you'll see. Uh, these are the uh, ones that I would want you to be familiar with. Of course, we already mentioned the right and left primary bronchi. Then you have the secondary bronchi, then the tertiary bronchi. And this is something that I've mentioned uh, in the past with other topics. When you see terms like primary, secondary, tertiary, those are not indicating uh, the importance of uh, a process. They are indicating the order in which things are occurring. Primary bronchi are the first uh, divisions from the trachea. Secondary happen after that, and tertiary happen after secondary. So it's telling you the numerical order of events. So primary is always first, and then secondary, and then tertiary, and so on. And then all of these divisions will eventually lead you to uh, the side of where gas exchange actually happens inside the lungs. That's the alveoli. And that is the plural form. Uh, singular would be alveolus but it's just generically referred to as alveoli. Very thin-walled sacs where the real work of the lungs uh, takes place. All right, for here, we have the larynx on top here, the thyroid cartilage here, trachea. Of course, left lung, right lung. Now, don't confuse left versus right, depending on where they are on the image. Remember, it's always about uh, the patient's point of view. Okay, so we have the uh, primary bronchi, that first division here. Then you have secondary bronchi, also known as lobar, and then and those will divide, and that will give you tertiary, also known as segmental bronchi, and those will divide uh, after that into what are called terminal bronchioles. So it's not wrong to call secondary bronchi lobar bronchi. 
or tertiary uh, segmental. But for our purposes, for our class, I think it's easier just to remember primary, secondary, tertiary. And then on this box here, you're zooming in on this collection of uh, alveoli, and this is how they would look. We'll talk more about these in a moment. All right, uh, this image, this is a real sampling of a trachea and various bronchi that have been dyed uh, with resin. And this is why this is called the bronchial tree. It looks like a tree that's upside down, where you could have the, the trunk of the tree up here, and the branches here, and then the various uh, smaller branches that come off of that. So think of a tree upside down. This is what you have uh, set up here. And the reason why you have these different colors, those are indicating uh, different regions, different lobes of the lungs, uh, different sizes of those, uh, of those divisions. All right, now we'll talk about the alveoli, a little bit more detail. And these are there to provide a very large surface area. And these, these thin sacs are really just very thin epithelial cells. And they're there for a gas exchange. This is where oxygen and carbon dioxide actually exchange places. And when I say a large surface area, a typical adult, a healthy typical adult, if you were to take uh, their lungs and spread them out like if you were putting, let's say, butter on a piece of bread, for example, a typical adult that's healthy, you could cover a full tennis court with just their lungs. That's how much surface area we're talking about here. So when it comes to actual gas exchange, exchanging carbon dioxide for oxygen, all of that happens due to one process. It's due to simple diffusion. So you have oxygen diffusing from the lungs into the blood, and then you have carbon dioxide diffusing from the blood into the alveoli. So something that's incredibly vital to keep you alive all happens due to simple diffusion. All right, so zooming in on one area of you know, these clusters of alveoli. Now, this is looking at one alveolus. And you can see how uh, arterioles and venules you know, and capillaries are going to be all wrapped around it. And each of these individual bubble structures here, that's one individual alveolus. So zooming in just on one alveolus, uh, this material here would be the inside of the lungs. You can follow the uh, blood flow here. And again, when you see images like this, if the color is blue, that's indicating a blood without oxygen. If it's red, it does have oxygen. And if it's purple, it's a mix. So think back to when we talked about the cardiovascular system. The blood leaving the uh, right ventricle through the pulmonary arteries that go to the lungs to get oxygen. So now this is where this takes over. And then right here, there is more oxygen inside of the lungs than there is in the blood. So oxygen will diffuse from the lungs into the blood. The opposite is true for carbon dioxide. There's more carbon dioxide in the blood than there is inside the lungs. So carbon dioxide will diffuse from the blood into the lungs. So that's what's going on here. That's why the color in this part of the image is more purple because you have an exchange of gases. Oxygen going into the blood from the lungs, then carbon dioxide leaving the blood to go inside of the lungs to be exhaled out. And so at this point, blood has oxygen. That's why this coloring is red. And this will finish the pulmonary circuit. At this point, blood has picked up the oxygen that it needs. It will go back to the heart through the pulmonary veins and enter the left atrium. So again, this is focused just on one alveolus, but this is happening in all alveoli in both lungs all the time. So if there is damage to alveoli through lung cancer or emphysema, cystic fibrosis, that's going to limit how well gases get exchanged within that patient. All right, here, this is a very, very zoomed in image of a bronchiole in the alveoli right around it. It looks almost like a, a honeycombed area, but all these openings are one individual alveoli. And then here would be the, the bronchiole, one of the smaller divisions of the bronchi. All right, next, we'll talk about the lungs in a little bit more detail. Of course, these are going to be soft and spongy, cone-shaped uh, structures that are found in the thoracic cavity. There is a different number of lobes between the right lung and left lung. The right lung has three lobes, and the left lung has two. And a term that you hopefully remember from our last chapter, 
hilum. This is the area where larger vessels and the bronchi actually enter each lung. So remember, hilum is not specific for the spleen or the lungs or the kidneys. It's a generic term that indicates any indented area where larger vessels uh, enter a structure. All right, so to give you a reference to where everything is, thyroid cartilage up here, trachea here, of course the ribcage here, and then the lungs, right, left. And this image actually gives you the proper names of each lobe. You know, the upper lobe, uh, left lung, then lower, uh, left lung, then superior, middle, and inferior for the right. Now the lungs are covered with a fairly long membrane called the pleura. Now this is a fairly thin membrane, and it actually is one long membrane, but it's actually folded over itself. One part of it will contact the lungs directly, and then the other part will line the inside of the rib cage. So both of those areas are going to have separate names. So the parietal pleura will line the rib cage and then contact the diaphragm. And then the visceral pleura will contact the lungs directly. And these terms, parietal and visceral, these are uh, generic uh, anatomical terms. Anything that is parietal will be lining a cavity. Anything that is visceral will contact an organ directly. So don't assume that parietal and visceral are only found with the lungs, because that's not true. So we have one membrane that's lining the inside of the thoracic cavity, then doubles back and folds and contacts the lungs itself. And that gives you a very, very small space in between those two layers. And that space is called the pleural cavity, or the pleural space. And this cavity is going to be filled with a particular kind of fluid that allows those layers to slide by one another whenever you are inhaling and exhaling. So that fluid is really a type of lubrication. So you can have that expansion of the lungs without causing any damage. All right, for here, this is illustrating uh, both layers of the pleura. So we'll look at the one in red first. That's going to be the parietal pleura. Now this lines the thoracic cage and then contacting the diaphragm down here and it goes all the way around and once it gets to the hilum right by here it's going to fold back over and then now it's contacting the lungs itself that's why this is a, a blue color so this blue coloring will be the a visceral pleura and then the space in between these two which is highlighted here that's the pleural cavity or the pleural space now, it's a lot more exaggerated uh, for this illustration, uh, this so you can get a reference. But in reality, this is a very, very small space. All right, next we'll talk about uh, the actual process of how uh, breathing works and various ways to measure breathing capacities. Breathing, and another term you may see used here is uh, ventilation. Again, the movement of air into and out of the lungs. Now, the actions that are uh, responsible for these movements of air into and out of the lungs are inspiration and expiration. And an easy way to keep this straight is if you're breathing in, that's inspiration or inhalation. If you are breathing out, if you are exhaling, that is expiration. Now air moves both into the lungs and out of the lungs all based on one thing. It's all based on a difference of pressure. Air will move along a pressure gradient. So it's going to go from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure. So this works exactly the same way as a concentration gradient, like we talked about with forms of uh, passive transport uh, in our last course. Now something that's important to understand is uh, the second bullet point here. Pressure and volume of gases are inversely related. This is known as Boyle's Law. So what that means is when one of those goes up, the other one goes down. So they are inversely related. So if you take a deep breath in, you are increasing the volume. But when you do so, you are lowering the pressure. And then the opposite of that is true. Whenever you are breathing out and exhaling, the volume goes down, but that means the pressure goes up. All right, we'll talk about various features of inspiration. First, the main muscle that's involved with breathing, both breathing in and out, is, of course, the diaphragm. When the diaphragm is signaled to contract, it flattens out. Its normal relaxed state is a upside down U or a bell shape. So when it contracts, it flattens. So when that happens, you are able to increase the volume 
in the thoracic cavity and able to take in more air. And then what is technically happening is atmospheric pressure is forcing air into the lungs. All right, the image over here on the left is uh, when a person is not breathing in or out. So you see, you see the diaphragm with this nice curved bell shape here. That's its normal relaxed state. And the pressure inside the lungs is uh, 760 uh, millimeters of mercury. It's also known as one atmosphere. So in this image, the person is taking a deep breath in. The diaphragm is contracting. That's why it's flattening out. So that's going to increase the volume. But when the volume goes up, pressure goes down. So now that pressure is 758 millimeters of mercury within the lungs. Well, normal atmospheric pressure is at 760. 760 is more than 758. And even though it's a small difference, it's still a difference. So air will go from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure. So air gets pushed into your lungs from the atmosphere. This is how you're able to breathe in. Okay, now we'll talk about the opposite process, expiration. Forces that are responsible for a normal expiration uh, come from the ability of tissue to recoil and able to recoil back without losing any uh, integrity or, or losing any strength. And it's also due to the surface tension within the alveoli. So whenever you're breathing out, that's going to create a pressure difference of around 1 to 2 millimeters of mercury above atmospheric pressure. So air gets pushed out of the lungs into the atmosphere. So we already talked about uh, inspiration on this graphic. We'll talk about this image here next. Diaphragm relaxes, so the volume will go down in the lungs, but that means the pressure goes up. So now this pressure is 763 millimeters of mercury. That is more than 760. Again, slight difference, but it's still a difference. So air will go from higher pressure to area of low pressure. So air will go from inside the lungs to outside of the lungs, which is how you're able to breathe out. And again, both of these processes, breathing in or breathing out, all happens due to the difference of pressure. Uh, last thing that we'll talk about for this chapter is the part that gives people the most uh, problems when it comes to this the system. That's all the respiratory volumes and the capacities. Whenever you have different degrees of effort of breathing in or breathing out, that's going to produce uh, different volumes of air going in or out. So we'll talk about four different volumes and four different types of capacities. And a capacity is just two or more volumes together. The first one is the tidal volume, or TV. This is the amount of air that moves in and out of the lungs at rest. So think of the tide at the ocean. It goes in, it goes out. There's no extra effort needed. So basically the breathing that you're doing right now. You're not forcibly breathing in more than you should or forcing air out. Normal, regular breathing. Next is the IRV, the inspiratory reserve volume. This is the amount of air that can be forcibly inhaled in addition to normal tidal volume. So this is taking a deep breath in. And the opposite of that, the ERV, expiratory reserve volume. This is the amount of air that can be forcibly exhaled in addition to normal tidal volume. So this is taking a deep breath out or forcing a deep breath out. And then uh, the last one here, RV, residual volume. This is the amount of air that's in the lungs at all times. There's no physical way you can get rid of all air in your lungs because your lungs are basically balloons within your thoracic cavity. And there's always going to be a pressure difference between uh, the atmosphere and then inside the lungs. That's how your lungs are able to work. So no matter how much you try to force air out, you can't exhale every single bit of the air in your lungs. The only way that is possible is if there's some kind of uh, injury. If someone is shot or stabbed and, and the pressure is equal and the air is completely out of the lungs, that means the lung has collapsed, which is something that you don't want to happen. Going on to uh, some capacities. Uh, the first one, a VC, the vital capacity. This is the maximum volume of air a person can inhale and exhale. So this is taking a deep breath in and then forcing that deep air out. So remember, it's a capacity. It is two or more volumes together. Uh, then you have the IC, inspiratory uh, capacity. Maximum volume of air a person can inhale after a resting expiration. That's the next one, FRC, the functional residual capacity. This is the volume of air that will remain in the lungs after a resting expiration. 
And the last one, which is probably the one of the easiest ones, uh, TLC, the total lung capacity. This is the vital capacity plus residual volume. So this is everything that your lungs can hold. Right, uh, whenever this topic is covered, no matter what text you use, you will see an image like this that tries to graph all of those volumes, all those capacities in one. And this is the best one I was able to find because it can get confusing. But this is probably the most straightforward and the most clear one. The small range here, tidal volume, you can see how it goes up and down pretty consistently. That's normal breathing at rest. No extra effort needed to breathe in or to breathe out. You see here uh, residual volume, roughly about 1,100 or 1,200 milliliters. That's the air that you can never get out of your lungs regardless of the force. The only way you're able to get rid of that volume of air is if you are injured somehow. The IRV, air that you can forcibly inhale. ERV, the amount that you can exhale. See, vital capacity, breathing in deeply, then exhaling deeply. So all of the uh, capacities we talked about, all of the volumes that we talked about on the last several slides are all uh, indicated here. All right, uh, next topic we'll talk about is alveolar gas exchange. We already talked about alveoli previously. But we'll talk a little bit more detail here. A part of the wall of the alveoli is made up of cells that will secrete a very particular uh, lipoprotein that helps to keep them inflated. Now, if the alveoli are not inflated, they cannot exchange uh, gases properly. And that uh, substance is called surfactant. So if that surfactant isn't there, the alveoli are going to deflate, which means they can't work, which means you're going to be losing some functionality in your lungs. So this is where conditions like uh, cystic fibrosis really have a, a horrible toll on a person because they are increasing that surfactant so much it becomes really, really thick and heavy to the point where it causes those alveoli to collapse. And then when you have that, that loss of tissue, then it's a lot more difficult to, to breathe properly. And the actual physical site where the gases exchange between the uh, alveoli and then the blood has a technical name that's the respiratory membrane it's also known as the alveolar capillary membrane but that's the actual site of where gases switch places here we have a a scanning electron image of a real alveoli and then real red blood cells so for here the as on either side here that indicates the alveoli space or alveolar space red blood cells rbcs here a bm the basement membrane because remember, we're talking about epithelial tissue here. Uh, the last topic we'll talk about uh, for this chapter is oxygen transport. Almost all, not all, but almost all oxygen uh, is carried in the blood uh, is bound to hemoglobin. And that's in the form of oxyhemoglobin. Remember when we talked about uh, various features of uh, blood cells. Uh, hemoglobin within uh, red blood cells you know, carry oxygen. Well, that combination of hemoglobin and oxygen together is known as oxyhemoglobin. So that's where that term comes from. And there are uh, several factors that will cause the release of oxygen. And those include a decrease in uh, partial pressure of oxygen, an increase in partial pressure of carbon dioxide, having an increase in acidity levels, or having an increase in temperature. All of those are going to cause more oxygen to be released from oxyhemoglobin and into the blood. So I would be familiar with what those uh, triggers are that will cause more oxygen to be released. All right, that brings us to the end of chapter 22. You know, if you do have questions on this chapter, you know, feel free to uh, post them on the discussion board uh, within Blackboard. You can also contact me directly, you know, either through uh, school email or, or texting me. And I'm also going to be having online office hours every Monday and Wednesday morning. So the times that we would normally be having uh, classes together, I'll be having online office hours. So between uh, 9.30 a.m. and 11, uh, Mondays and Wednesdays, I'll be using Blackboard Collaborate uh, for that. So if you do have questions, please uh, contact me. Uh, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video.